Okay, it says meeting is being recorded. Got it. Okay, for the, I'm going to do a quick little shift for a second here. Uh, for those who are joining this, uh, which is right now a, I'm, I'm also trying a little experiment, folks, in the sense that I'm doing a TikTok live to kind of encourage people if they want to see this and if they want to follow along to come on over to the meetup and check it out in real time or see what I'm doing. I'm mainly doing this as a little bit of a preamble at the moment, at the moment because I want to make it clear to the people on the live that while I am speaking, I won't be able to answer any questions that they type up. Um, so I might hold up something like a little sign saying, by the way, while I'm speaking, <laughs> can't actually do this. So uh, <coughs> this is an experiment. It may work well. It may fail spectacularly. But uh, with that in mind, uh, Moss, uh, Phil, go ahead and Let's... Yeah, well, first, it's uh, it's great to have you here, Michael. And uh, for those that are attending, you get the honor and and the uh, privilege of being with us today and, and speaking with Michael on a topic that I think is really, really um, relevant to today and all this talk about shifting left. Really shifting left is, you know, the first step is really, you know, are we testing something that is testable? and asking the right questions to get to that. So I think this is a really gonna be a great webinar. And as I said in my LinkedIn post, uh, it's always a pleasure to have Michael um, attend Michael's talks because they're very uh, conversational and really engaging. So um, Michael, let's see if we can uh, get this thing going here. I can't right. see. I am ready if you are, I am currently sharing. So let's go ahead and do this. Uh, first of all, for everybody who is joining, whether you're joining through Meetup for the PNSQC Meetup, or if you happen to be watching this live at the moment, I want to say thank you for everybody who is here, and uh, let's go ahead and get started. So this talk is called, Is This Testable? The Recording in progress. And the under, you know, the, uh, the subtitle for it is, A Personal Journey to learn how to ask better questions from my applications and engineering team. And uh, I'll go ahead and uh, we'll run through this real fast. And uh, in part, we wanna be able to uh, let PNSQC explain who they are and the fact that they've got a conference coming up. You'll notice October 11th through 13th, 2021. And um, I should also note that we have a discount registration code. So if you can see that, grab that. And if you go to the site and enter in the details, you can then uh, get 10% um, off of the um, off the fee for registration, as well as two additional books that are going to be added to that. And I think that might very well be a uh, uh, Moss or Phil. If you have details about that, feel free to jump in and and mention it. Yeah, these books are actually from one of our keynote speakers, Eric Van Vanendal, and. Uh, they've got actually got an $80 value, and one of them is called The Testing Practitioner, and the other book is called uh, The Little TMMI, which is a takeoff of, um, uh, it's about testing processes and uh, how to improve your test process. So uh, I've got a great discount code there. Type that in, and you'll get 10% off as well as a set of these books. All right. I'll just, I'll just raise my finger like this. <laughs> just, just a little bit about PNSQC. We're in our 39th year. We're a nonprofit and all volunteer organization. And we focus on the quality practitioner. So that's about folks that are really out there in the field and doing stuff with their bare hands, uh, working in uh, as test engineers and software quality engineers describing their own experiences, not necessarily be, you know, as a consultant. So that's one of the focuses of our conference. Um, this year's program is gonna be really awesome. Although it's our second virtual conference, we're really building up a lot of, uh, we've really got a great program here with technical papers as well as presentations. Uh, we've also got uh, some great keynotes and invited talks, as well as eight half-day workshops. And um, our first two days consists of the conference papers with the presentations, as well as tutorials, keynotes, 
and invited talks. And the third day is dedicated to workshops. So um, be great to have you guys attend. Like I said, we have a discount code for the books as well as 10% off. All right, so Yeah, it's okay, Michael. Uh, so, uh, no, a little bit about me. Um, first of all, if you wanted to, Michael skipped over one of the most important slides of the whole. Oh, I'm sorry, hold on, let me jump back. <laughs> there. Which was really about, you know, if there's anyone here that wants to volunteer and be part of our community, we'd be glad to have you. There's many different roles that you can contribute your skills and expertise. Um, not only as an author, where we're now changing our mode to have contributions year long and being an author at PNSQC and contributing to our content that we have online, online for folks, as well as our monthly meetups, uh, which are in webinar format, kind of like what we're doing today. And Michael's volunteering his time in sharing his knowledge with us. And we welcome any members of our community to do so as well as writing articles and so on. Or you can also volunteer um, many different little facets of ways that you can contribute to the community, whether you wanna be a, a website uh, uh, guru in up to helping us update our content or uh, working on site for our live conferences, which hopefully will be started up again next year. Many different things that you can do. We, we welcome you to our community. Oh, Artem is asking, how do I volunteer? Wow, is there a place to submit a talk? You can do that right online. We have, uh, I think there's a tab, a menu tab for volunteering. So please write into us and uh, submit a talk as well. On which website? On the pnsqc.org. So <laughs> if you look Thank at you. my email there, uh, or on the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, there's pnsqc.org. And you can go there. And I believe towards the right of the top menu structure, there's a volunteering tab. There it is. OK. Um, just a little bit about me. I'm the program chair at PNSQC. I've been the program chair for a couple of years now. And um, I also do a lot of speaking myself and, and writing and contributing knowledge. But today is really about Michael. So Michael. Um, We're really fortunate to have Michael here with us today. And Michael has spoken at uh, many of our conferences and he's also spoken at several other conferences as well. And he has a really broad expertise. The last time he came and spoke at our conference, he talked about um, accessibility, which is really a really cool topic and it's, something that's often ignored by um, us as software testers, but I'll let Michael introduce himself and uh, begin his talk. All right, thank you very much, Philip. I greatly appreciate it. Hello, everybody. And uh, for those who are coming in uh, just in the last couple of minutes, both uh, at the PNSQC meetup, as well as the fact that I'm also running this as a TikTok live at the same time. This is kind of an experiment. so. I'm curious to see who participates. Maybe some folks on the TikTok Live might want to come over to the meetup and uh, participate here or just hear what's going on here. I'm just mentioning this because I'm going to do my best to focus on the, the, the gist of the talk for the most part, and I'm not going to be able to really answer questions during the live thing. I will be happy to answer questions uh, as the talk ends, of course, and Feel free to share. A little bit about me. I'm a senior automation engineer with LTG People Fluent. Uh, LTG stands for Learning Technologies Group. They're located in London, UK. And People Fluent is a subsidiary of LTG. They are located in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I am a completely remote engineer located in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, I am a senior automation engineer by virtue of the fact that that is my title. <laughs> that's what they decided to call me. And that's what HR puts on my paycheck. So there it is. Uh, I've, I have spent three decades in IT and software testing at this point. I just realized that, that 1991 was my first year. 
uh, in the tech industry. And I've done a bunch of stuff since then. I've worked on uh, stuff like network routers and switches, uh, the first wave of virtual machines that Connectix introduced, which uh, kind of led the way to things like VMware and, uh, and Hyper-V and you know, virtual box and all the other things that we uh, know and love today, including things like, and now, now being used in things like Docker. Uh, capacitance touch devices. If any of you own an iPhone, that screen is a capacitance touch device. I've worked on video games for a number of years. Uh, specifically, I was hired to uh, help bring out the game Karaoke Revolution. Uh, I worked for Konami at that point in time. Also working on a number of other titles. A uh, cute little side note, by the way, uh, if you ever play Karaoke Revolution Volume 3, or if you play the online version of the game through uh, PlayStation, and you load the song China Grove, the guide vocal you will hear is me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in the past, uh, I want to say 15, 16 years, I have primarily worked in the uh, enterprise web application space. And specific to that, I've been working on uh, recently, I am focused on data transformation and uh, getting, getting data from one side of an app to another app, if you will, and being able to be the middle person in there to get those two apps to talk to each other, play with each other, and get the data that's necessary from one side to the other. It's an interesting uh, space and a unique challenge. Uh, I've also, of course, worked in the UI space where I've, like many people and who, especially those who are what they would classically typically call software testing and QA for a front end application. What I do right now doesn't really have a front end. So the testing that I currently do might not be as focused. So a lot of what I'm going to be discussing in this talk leverages my previous gig that I was doing just before the one here. So just want to get that out of the way. A um, little bit about my outside of work stuff. I am a black belt in the Miyagi-Do School of Software Testing. I am a lead instructor of the Black Box Software Testing course through the Association for Software Testing. I write a blog called Test Head. Uh, in fact, and I'm also on Twitter and basically anywhere else online. If you just look for at MKL Test Head, you will be able to find my information. And uh, I, if you go to my LinkedIn profile, I have a list of previous articles, papers, presentations. I also was a contributor to the uh, book, How to Reduce the Cost of Software Testing. That came out about a decade ago, so it's not terribly, um, I don't want to say, it, well, it's actually, it's still relevant, but it was written a decade ago. So take that for what it's worth. But uh, all those references and such can be seen on my LinkedIn article, in my LinkedIn profile. Please feel free to uh, stop by and hang out and uh, check in with me if you want to. All right, so let's go ahead and get into the gist of this talk. And the cool thing is, is that this is something that every one of you can play along with at home if you want to. Uh, it's a literal challenge that everyone can do. If you're familiar with the Ministry of Testing, they construct a number of 30 days of challenges. As a matter of fact, today, they just started their brand new challenge, and that brand new challenge is 30 days of tools. So if you want to go in there and get in on the ground floor for something that's happening in the current time and see what other people are talking about while they're doing it as it's fresh, you have that opportunity to do so. But I'm going to be referencing one that was done a couple of years ago, and that's the main focus of this talk. And that was their 30 days of testability. So what this talk is, this is an experience report of me putting in the time for those 30 days and reaping the results. And that have followed on. And it says here on the six months after taking that challenge, actually, this could technically be on the two and a half years since taking that challenge. But most of the stuff I'm talking about here deals with that first six month period after I committed to doing this. And to be clear here, I am not a testability expert, but I am an expert in my own experiences, and that's what I'm sharing here. And hopefully some things that you might be able to take home and play with on your own time and see if uh, it's something that you wanna be able to work with. So let's go ahead. And as I said, just go to Ministry of Testing and look up 30 days of testability and you can get the entire checklist as it's displayed here. 
So let's talk a little bit about what testability means. If you are going to be discussing or talking about anything relating to testability, that's the first thing you need. You need to be able to communicate. You need to be able to talk to people and be able to make it possible for them to understand what it is you want to accomplish. You need to be involved. You cannot do this passively. You are going to be an active participant. In fact, you are probably going to provoke the people on your development team. And if you're a developer, you as well. And this is not something that you can just kind of hang back and go, oh, hey, I'd love to see what we can do for this. If you are genuinely going to be involved in testability, you're going to have to get your sleeves rolled up and dig in. And you will need to have a willingness to look at a product objectively and determine what would make it more testable and quite possibly more usable. All right. So let's talk about what testability is as a definition. This is the formal definition of testability. And that is the logical property that is variously described as contingency, defeasibility, or falsifiability, which means that counterexamples to the hypothesis are logically possible the practical feasibility of, of observing a reducible series of such counterexamples if they do exist. All right, on the count of three, who wants to groan with me at that? Because that's awful. That is an overblown and ridiculous. Actually, I, I shouldn't say ridiculous. It's very specific. But I think I can do one better if you don't mind. My definition is, is a hypothesis is testable if there is some real possibility of deciding whether it is true or false based on real experience. And I will turn my time a little bit over to Professor Farnsworth because he is sciencing as fast as he can. And for those of you who are wondering why am I putting up a slide and a picture about the scientific method? Well, because when you get right down to it, the scientific method is the basis of testability. And I'll give a real quick rundown of what the scientific method is. A little refresher for those at home. The scientific method is make an observation. In other words, what is happening? Define a question or the question. Why is this happening? Form a hypothesis. I think this happens because dot, dot, dot. Perform an experiment. Let's test my hypothesis. Let's see if this is happening because dot, dot, dot. Analyze the data. Was my hypothesis right? And then conclusion or presents, present your results. My experiments show my hypothesis was either accurate or not accurate. It's been refuted. And then you can science some more and see if based off of the fact that your hypothesis doesn't hold up, why doesn't it hold up? What did you maybe miss or what should you be doing instead? Add that, try out your experiment again, lather, rinse, repeat. The scientific method is absolutely critical to software testing. And if you are a software tester or involved in software testing in any capacity, always remember that the scientific method is your friend and practice it as much as possible. So what is the goal of any test that we want to perform? I basically ran through that, it's fine. Um, let me give you a specific example of something and we'll get specific using data. So I do a lot of stuff with accessibility. And because of the fact that I do a lot of stuff with accessibility, I like to present from the idea of, let's take something like color contrast. Color contrast is very often used as, a, as an aspect of a product being accessible or not being accessible. So I'm gonna give you a subjective criteria, okay? A light gray text over a dark gray background doesn't provide a significant amount of color contrast. 
Okay. Is that a reasonable statement? The answer is, yeah, it is a reasonable statement. Is it testable? No, at least not the way that I've presented it. I mean, it seems reasonable, but there's no way to really confirm that. So now let's put some data behind it. What do we know about colors that are displayed on a screen? Well, we know that any color that's displayed on a screen can be represented by hexadecimal or RGB numerical values. And the beauty of that is because those numbers extend from anywhere from an RGB from zero to 255 and from F, you know, hash zero, 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 zero to hash F, 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 F. Um, you can take those options and compare them to each other. And based on that, you can determine a ratio between values. So these two colors look to be too close together. If you see the foreground color, it's got a value of 385898. And it's got a background of 426.7b2. Those are hex values. Uh, and it's as it's displayed on the screen. Okay, that's not a testable hypothesis to just say these two colors look to be too close together. But these two color ratio, these two colors have a contrast ratio of 1.26 to 1. And we are looking for a contrast ratio of 4.5 to 1 at the minimum. Now that is a testable hypothesis. And it also contains data points that support it. So if you want to show that this is not a reasonable color contrast, don't say the, they look too close together. Give that number, 1.26 to 1. It fails. It needs to be 4.5 to 1 for it to pass, at least by WCAG 2.0 2A standards. Another thing that I picked up from this challenge and that I found to be very helpful, many people ignore one of the greatest pieces of information and testability that they have at their disposal. And that is your logs that your application creates. Log files show the history of events and actions that take place in the system. Now, to be clear, the sheer volume of information can be genuinely overwhelming. Odds are you can't just open up a log file, look and go, oh, hey, great, that's what it is. You might need to get in there, take a log file, save off some information, do some parsing, look for some values to actually say, oh, here, I've narrowed down a little space that can tell me something. Other, and another key piece to realize when we say, what is the application? There's the actual application that I'm working with, sure, but there's also the extended suite of applications that plug into ours. So as an example, I worked on a platform that was, for all intents and purposes, a wiki. And that wiki allowed people to, rem to remotely connect to it, contribute to it. There were some additional tools and some additional uh, features that were added to it. And over time, that grew into microservices, that grew into sharing with other groups, that grew, in, grew into importing and exporting data for other applications to use. My current job, by the way. Um, and each one of those has like a tool to support it. There was Solar for searching. There was Nginx for the web service. There was AWS monitoring because it was in the cloud. There was Docker monitoring because it was running inside of a Docker application, uh, inside of a Docker container, excuse me. And so all of that, when you put it together, allows you to say, hey, what do these interactions have to do with my application? It's like, hey, I'm not able to complete something. My log doesn't tell me anything, but maybe the Nginx log tells me something. Or maybe the solar log tells me something, or maybe the Docker log tells me something. So all of those are relevant and you'll wanna be able to take a look at them. And what might you be able to do? Well, if you're doing installations or upgrades, or if you have an authentication or third-party plugins or your mail daemon or your web, like I said, web server log and search engine, et cetera. All of those have the ability of giving you 
a treasure trove of information. But again, you have to either be looking for it or understand what you need to be looking for. So I'm gonna give you now what I call a blinding flash of the obvious. Um, for those of you who use a window, like, you know, like use a bash shell window in whatever system you have, you may have the option for screen, Tmux or Biobu. Those are screen multiplexers. And a multiplexer allows you to take that session and split it up into multiple sessions. And by doing so, you can split it into panes horizont horizontally or vertically. I like splitting the screen horizontally and stacking up windows in lines because it makes it easier to read and I can stretch it out over the entire screen. Or if I have a dedicated monitor screen amongst many, I can just say, hey, this one over here is just for this uh, Tmux window. I'm gonna extend it the entire distance. And for every single one of my log files, I'm gonna split out a multiplexing session. And in addition to that, I am going to also put in one of the log files and I'm gonna tail it. And then therefore you can see which of your logs are gonna be really greedy and are gonna be updating all the time and which of your logs barely get updated at all. And so you can get, get a gauge of, oh, okay, this one's gonna be active. I'm gonna need, need to pay attention or this one's gonna to be too active and I'm gonna to have to do some parsing on it later. But other ones might not even give you a line or two every time you do a transaction. You might do a dozen or a hundred transactions before one of those logs even updates. But you can log it and you can watch it in real time. And by doing so, you can find out if you are getting the information that you need. Now here's something to, let me give you an actual testability thing you can bring back to your team right now. Now, they may not like this idea, especially if you're working with legacy systems or you're working with systems that whose log um, format is being decided on outside of your team. If it's being out decided outside of your team, you don't have any impact on this. You just accept that. But if most of what you're doing is in-house and you have any influence at all with your development team or other developers on other teams, champion a common log format. And I gave an example here. What I would recommend doing is make it so that your logs, especially if you need to bundle them together and, uh, you know, and, and zip them up for archive purposes. By doing that, what you can do is you can give each line that you see, give it a log name, give it a timestamp, give it an alert level, give it a module, and then the message that follows after it. Make that uniform if you possibly can. The reason is, is it makes it very easy for you to parse whatever log you're looking at. You know what you're looking at. You know when you're looking at it. You know if the alert you're getting is informational or it's a mission critical problem, where the actual problem is appearing, and also real information you can share with, uh, with, with the users or the testers of your product. And again, messages, if you can possibly do so, make them as human readable as possible. I'm sure many of us have experiences trying to dig through a crash from a Java exception going, oh my gosh, what is going on here? <laughs> so definitely something we all want to encourage. So that's something you can take to your team right now. I can't promise that people are going to answer it or they're even gonna like you much for bringing it up, but it does share benefits. I know because I actually watched them do that at the team I was at. Identify a partner in crime. Now, if you're a software tester or if you're a support engineer, oftentimes testers and support engineers share roles. I've done this over my career many times where as if testing work kind of dried up for a little bit or we were in between, oftentimes I was given the role of helping out the support engineers or being an escalation point if the support engineer couldn't figure out a problem. And so I got a chance to work with that. And that developed a good working relationship with the support and the sales engineering team. So by virtue of that, I was able to communicate with them and say, hey, do you have some examples of some work environments that could help us replicate testing a little bit better? 
I had a great sales engineer who did a whole lot of setups and had a number of these environments. And we made an agreement to say, let's salt the data or change it in a way that it can't, that it can't come back to our customers and say, hey, you're using our data for testing. Not really. We've made it so that it's completely unrecognizable. And if anybody were to inadvertently grab it, they wouldn't be able to do anything with it. But we still have enough data in there to actually do our tests. And that's helpful because that gives us the ability of setting up big clustered servers if needs be, um, multiple load balancers, or we could have database replication in the background, and ways to look at real data that a sanitized and homogenized small test environment just won't give you. Another thing that I can strongly recommend is use feature analytics. There's a number of tools that are out there that can allow you to do this. Um, the tool, I mean, I'm not giving any sales pitch for it, but a tool that we used is called Pendo. And there's others that are out there too. So take a look around. But what does a feature analytic allow you to do? Feature analytics basically scores whenever a user accesses that particular module or that particular component. So the idea is this came about and we decided to look at this because we've had multiple times where an influential customer said, hey, we really need to have this feature. This feature needs to be included with this product. Okay, and then we spent months developing it, testing it, rolling it out, only to realize that whoever decided that that was a really important feature, they didn't tell their customer base or they didn't tell their users that that was an important feature because they weren't using it. So how do you know? Well, by having feature, by having feature analytics, you can actually see if that feature that you've developed is getting a high amount of adoption or at least a high amount of use and which aspects of it are actually being used. So if you notice after a six month uh, run through that this big feature that you have has a 2% adoption rate, well, at least now you know, and you can say, do we gracefully retire this or do we figure out another way of making this more useful to the customers that ask for it. If they're asking for it, there's gotta be a reason for it. And what is that reason? So it's something to consider when you get into that. Another key feature that I wanna talk about here, a lot of times when we say that something is testable, that's shorthand for we can automate it. Not necessarily. And I want to draw attention to Alan Richardson's article, Automatable, actually it's a website, Automatable and Testable. And the fact that these are not necessarily the same thing. Just because you can automate something doesn't necessarily mean that it's testable. Automatability, how's that for a big word? Automatability means that something else can interact with it. Maybe a program can go in and interact, a shell script can go in, or an API can go in and you can get some of those details out. You're creating hooks for those systems to interact with it. If your only ability to interact with an application is through the front end, like say a web browser, and you have to go in and make extreme efforts to plot out every single step of your application, and go in and say, hey, I need to use this and do this and do this and do this and do this, and you plot it all out, that's not really a testable solution because you are stuck using that tool. And if for some reason the test breaks on you, you don't have another option. But if you're able to go in and run a curl command, for example, and get that information back and then export it to another program that you can run to parse your information and determine if the value that you have is correct or not correct, that's a lot more flexible and a lot more usable for you as a tester. In other words, those allow you those options. And also just because something can interact with it, like you can run a web browser tool like Selenium or WebDriver and drive it, sure, you can go through the steps. You can confirm that you can run the steps, but you can't confirm that what you are putting together is a 
usable experience for your customer. It's doable, but it might be an absolute pain in the neck. So the key thing here is testability is for humans and automatability or automatizability is for actions. And automatizability, that's Alan's word. <laughs> so let me give you an example. So let's say you have an applications menu bar. Can you click on the various elements and open other you know, modules with the application? Yeah, that can certainly be automated. However, let's say from an accessibility standard, can you go in and use your keyboard and tab through to the right key in a reasonable way? You may not be able to do that. And if you are looking at saying, okay, I wanna simulate that accessibility path, Let's go through and let's uh, utilize the keyboard strokes to get to that item. Can you do it without hitting your tab key 35 times? If you can't, that's a definite problem and that's a testability issue. Instead of saying, hey, I got to tab through 35 times to get to this particular record, you can say, how about if we use the accessibility WCAG standard and use Control Alt N to get to this value because that's what allows us to do that. Oh, I wasn't aware that was an option. Cool, let's go ahead and give that a shot. By doing that, that lets you get around that big mess of having to hit the tab key 35 times. So testability can add a number of options to a program and it can help make it more enjoyable for a user. It's not necessary or something you have to do for your end users, but many times putting in testing hooks, making it possible to interact via a REST API or some other way of sending in information and getting that information back, that opens up a lot of possibilities to where if you only allow them to go through the front end, then that slows things down or it makes it a lot longer of a process. Whereas instead, if you can construct a query and my favorite way of doing it is putting it in the script file and using curl, for example, and just going, hey, I'm going to curl in. Here's my authentication. Here's what I want. Can you give me that information back? And if it gives me it back, I can then run it through another script, parse it, make it pretty, put it in whatever columns or order I want to, and then take a look at it real fast or scan for it to say, does it have what I'm looking for? Yes. Awesome. Let's do that. Just because you're the tester, you might think, oh, I'm the only person that's ever going to interact with this product that way. Don't be so sure. Every time you go into a story workshop or a Three Amigos meeting or whatever it is that you want to participate with, if you jump in and you say, hey, me as a tester, I'm participating here. I'm listening to the requirements. They're describing how this story is going to be developed. At the back of your mind, you should always be thinking, how am I going to test this? Now, if it's self-evident and you got it down, okay, you don't really have to say very much. But even if you think it's self-evident, start asking those questions anyway. That's why you're in the meeting. How am I going to test this? What's the best approach to being able to say, I need to understand this. Help me to understand this. Do I understand this effectively? And if not, what am I missing? Or is there something that I would need to know to effectively make this work? Let's give a somewhat nebulous example from my current reality. Okay, we have this large chunk of data that is going to be uploaded to our SFTP server. And that large chunk of data from a particular customer is going to be processed through the tools that we utilize. We're gonna take that, we're gonna convert that data into JSON or into XML. And once we've done that, once we've modified that information, then we pass it on to another client. Now it might be a database that stores it, or it might be another application that imports that data and can then populate its screens based on the information that we provided. And this might be a, you know, this could be anywhere from, hey, I'm, I'm exporting one user's record because, you know, learning technologies group and people fluent, 
they do things having to do with customer training and other things related to that. But the people fluent side of things is traditionally an HR package. And so very often it's, hey, we're importing a resume, but that resume is coming from a different program. Well, we know what most of that data should kind of be. So we're going to take that and we're going to parse it out and we're going to break it out into an agreed format that this customer and us said, as long as you present it like this, we can work with it. If you present it in a different format that we don't know, all bets are off. Cool. So knowing that format ahead of time, have it come in. Once you have that, then you know if you have it in JSON or XML, you can save off those files if you so choose, and you can parse them and you can look for whatever you want to, to verify that the XPath values are correct and that you're getting legitimate values for each of the fields, if they're required or if they're optional, et cetera. And then once you have it, you can then export it again and push it into another application, maybe a database, whatever the, whatever the end destination point is. And then by doing that, bring that up in the new application and say, awesome, here's the information that I got from that original application. We imported it, we transformed it, we exported it, they imported it, it's exactly what we wanna see. So me, being in that room, hearing that that's what we're going to be doing, how can I test each of those steps? What are the things I need to do? How do I test the SFTP process? How do I test the XML or JSON transform? How do I test that export to another application? How do I test that it can properly pull it in? How do I test that the values that I started with are the values that I end up with? And if there are any discrepancies there, are they expected discrepancies or are they problems? So yeah, it's self-evident, but it's important. Always be willing to ask this question and ask it frequently. And especially my team has gotten very used to me being that person who asks about these things. My team's very helpful with uh, providing these solutions. And if we don't have a solution, well, we'll I'll take it offline and we'll see what we can do to figure out how we can do it. Oftentimes it's like, oh, there's a database hook that we have uh, or that we need, but you don't know about it. So let me introduce you to it. Or, okay, we're going from one database to another database. That means we're going to have to do some interesting steps in the transform. Let's hook up together as a you know, dev and test and let's see what we need to do to make this work. Sweet. One thing I want to also recommend is asking this, how am I going to test it question works a lot easier the earlier in the process you ask it. Okay, It's much easier to add a testing hook early in the process than later on, or especially adding it in a legacy product might be very difficult. And the proverb here is the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. Second best time is now. Another thing you can do that's really important is get a handle on your test data. And there are a number of ways you can go about doing this. And when I mean your test data is what, you know, what would you be using? How would you represent what your application is doing? I am a big fan of what I call scenario-based testing. And scenario-based testing means I try to use human data as much as possible or data that's easy to represent. Now, for many years, uh, I'm a big anime nerd, and I have watched a lot of series over the years. So I have created blocks of test data that reference particular stories and that have particular names. And so I'll go through that. In fact, my, my uh, previous test team had a good laugh because I had this whole blocked out version of Attack on Titan, Shinjeki no Kyojin for those who speak Japanese. And I recreated a lot of that information. I made business groups based off of the various military designations. I took certain characters and grouped them together based off of attributes. And they had towns and they had cities that they were associated with that came from the series. And why did I do that? The reason is, is that me personally, I knew those series so well that if I saw a name I wasn't expecting, it would jump out at me immediately. Whereas if you had randomized data or 
names you don't necessarily recognize, you might not notice if something's out of place. But for me, I would notice that if uh, I saw Annie Leonhardt and Aaron Yeager in the same group, I would go, uh-oh, something's out of place here. Let's go see what I can do to fix that or have a conversation with somebody about what's going on here. So reasons why you might create multiple accounts and those accounts might be used for specific things. So I use, a, I use accounts for localization. I have accounts that have almost entirely Japanese text or Korean text or Chinese or Mandarin Chinese text or Arabic text. And those allow me again, through those tests, if I pull in an account, I expect to see it a certain way. And if I load it up and I notice that my Korean account is, print, is printing out in English, uh-oh, there's some localization text that's not showing up. And I need to figure out what that is. And that's an easy way to do it. Accessibility and inclusive design allows for certain things in regards to contrast levels, size of fonts, scalability, alternative text for pictures, uh, the ability of hearing the text through a screen reader, etc. And large customer simulations, like you may have a customer that has 100,000 records or half a million records, and you need to import that data as a regular test. It's an obnoxiously long test, but it needs to be done. So it's important to have that data in hand. Cover that. So free tool that I wanna to recommend to anybody. Some of you may already know about this, but if you don't know about this, it's, it's a hacker's favorite. And it's called the Fake Name Generator. And the fake name generator is developed specifically to give you usable data in a format that matches what databases would accept for key values. For example, like an area code or a phone number or a country code or a properly formatted birth date, uh, tropical zodiac, if you want you know, to include that, name, address, city, state, zip code, country codes, et cetera, gender, any type of details you might want to include. You can create other things too, like email addresses, usernames, passwords, a website URL, for example, or if you wanna create a browser's user agent, it includes that too. And you can make these unique for every user you create. You can create a user one at a time. You could make a request for them to ship you out a, a CSV file so that you can import data in bulk. And this is a free tool. And the maximum number, at least the last time I checked it, the maximum number of records you could create for free on any given day was 10,000. That's a pretty good number of records to work with. So if you wanna be able to cre create something to where you are able to have that many people, cool. That allows you that option. But at the same time, if you need more than that, eh, okay, you might have to wait a few days to accumulate that many. And if you don't have the time for that or need that, or if it's like, no, we need 500,000, you can like say, okay, I want a pro version or can you generate X amount? Here's a fee to do so. They, they allow that as well. Another thing that's definitely a process that I was very actively involved in. So before my previous role of being a senior automation engineer, in addition to being a software tester, I was also the release manager and the build manager for each of our releases. That meant that I did a lot of the handle of what went in and what was associated with each release train. And because of that, when it was time for a release to go out the door, and this is in a more traditional mode, not a continuous delivery, because of our customer base and the fact that we had both um, hosted and on-premises customers, we couldn't just say, hey, we're pushing out to everybody uh, at the same time that we had to stagger our releases. And that allowed us to give a chance to accumulate certain things and they went out at a given time. And that also allowed us to do show and tell sessions. And a show and tell session is just what it sounds like, it's demo. You get the group together and say, hey, guess what? The release 745 is going out. I sent out the release notes to everybody so that you can see what features are being updated or what bugs are being fixed. So let me demonstrate for you what we fixed, what new feature is here, ask me questions, give us some details of what we want. That's a chance for me as the tester and the demo person, as I'm running it, to hear back from the product owners or the support team or a um, 
interested customer if they wanted to join and say, hey, we ordered that and that sounds great, but you're missing X. Or, you know, I know that we said we wanted it this way, but now that I've seen it in person, that's not exactly what I had in mind. I was really thinking of something more along this line. Yep, happens. If we're good with our story workshops and we are doing proper communication, those don't happen often, but I promise they'll happen. So being able to go in and be prepared to demo this and talk through the issues is a great way to get that feedback, bring it back to the development team, say, hey, we hit the mark on 10 of these items, but two of these items are a little wonky or mm, here's a couple of things we need, to, we need to consider. And again, go back to your story workshop and keep asking, how do I test that? If you don't already have your developers and testers pairing together or doing mob programming or mob testing or you know, mob development and testing at the same time, it's an avenue you should probably consider. Now, you don't have to do it all the time, but it is my experience that a lot gets done and accomplished when you get a developer and a tester together in what I call a pilot navigator relationship. Now, if the developer is developing and you're able to sit on the session, either sitting over their shoulder literally or in a TMUX session or a, or a Zoom call, and you can see each other's screens as the developer is writing in the code and I'm watching them write in the code, I'm able to think ahead of time, oh, okay, here's something I want to talk about or here's something I want to test. Do you mean this in this capacity? When you say that we're going to have this stored procedure run, is that going to only affect a single customer or is that going to affect everybody that has access to that particular database? Is this database local or is it more global? Is it only on this server or is it something that we're going to have to work through on multiple servers? If we do database replication, is this going to be picked up? So those are things that you can ask in real time as they're developing. And if you ask that, they go, oh, hey, good idea. Let me put a hook in there so we can guarantee that. They're already thinking about that. And you're testing with them in active real time. And by doing so, you're explaining, hey, here's going to be a problem. Hey, how do we get over here? Or, hey, you've uploaded this. Let me run through it. Oh, you know what? Dang it. The locator that we have here is dynamic. That's going to be a real pain. What can we do to make that easier? Oh, okay. Uh, let me set that into a class or let me do that in this different way or let me give a label that's going to always be the same no matter what the locator ID is. Cool. Those are simple little examples that will allow you to, again, make things more repeatable, make things more testable, and ideally make things more flexible so that not only one tool or one approach can be used when you're testing. A great article, web, you know, web article for this is Pairing with Developers, a guide for testers. Lisa Crispin wrote this, it's for free up on the Ministry of Testing site. And again, when you have these sessions, definitely encourage on both sides, by the way, if a developer isn't sure what the tester is gonna be, be doing, might make sense to have a little bit of a chat in advance, do your homework. You know, know what you're going to need to be doing. If you're going to be doing a pairing session and the pairing session is going to be heavily based on database uh, development and objects, and you don't know the first thing about SQL, you're probably not going to be as effective in that space. Likewise, if you're programming in Ruby on the regular because that's what you've decided to test with and your developers are using C Sharp and .NET Core, your Ruby skills might help a little bit, but you might struggle a bit into being able to understand what they're doing. So that might also help get a chance to look ahead of time or explain, hey, you know what? I'm not really strong with C Sharp and .NET Core. Can you kind of give me an idea of what's going on here? And over time, you'll need that less and less. And especially if you get a chance to practice it on your own. You don't want to make these marathon sessions. I honestly, I typically say, two hours at the maximum, and maybe even less. A preferred approach that I like to do is I like to do what I call a Pomodoro method. And Pomodoro is just a time management thing. It's based off of a timer that uh, shaped like a tomato. Pom Pom Pomodoro, excuse me. Uh, uh, Pomodoro is a, uh, is a tomato. And it's just, again, it was, it was named cheekily after this uh, 
timer that was shaped like a tomato. But the Pomodoro technique is you put 25 minutes on the clock and you punch through, and then you take a five minute break. And then you put 25 minutes on the clock, punch through, take a five minute break. Same deal for the next hour. So you get uh, basically a hundred minutes of focus time, and then you get a 20 minute break within that two hours to be able to make sure that you're not getting overloaded. And if you feel that you're, you're fresh and you're strong, go ahead and do another one if, 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 if you so decide. Honestly, you can do an awful lot in those two hours. And because you're going to be so very focused on the effort that you're doing, you might find that that's plenty. Uh, caveat emptor and check things out the way you want to. Hey, Michael, we should probably wrap up soon so people can, I'm sure they have a lot of questions for you. Yes, yes, we're almost there. Um, so I'll, I'll do these, I'll, I'll jump through these pretty quickly. So identify your dependencies. Most modern applications aren't self-contained. You're going to need to interact with other apps. And those other apps might have certain operational parameters that you might not be able to interact with. And those you might have to accept. Or if you can't interact with them, again, see how you can leverage what they have. If nothing else, hey, somebody's published their API, great, make sure you understand their API and how we communicate with it. That's an easy, that's, a, that's an easy win, frankly. If it's all web-based, okay, not the greatest, but over time you might be able to figure out some key things to work with. Um, here's a little hint too, go into your source control history and do something that I call feeling the heat. So feeling the heat is where are we making frequent changes? What components do those changes interact with? And the closer the level of interaction, like if you have a module that interacts with four or five other modules, then that's telling you where you want to look for possible breaks. And by going through, I call that feeling the heat and looking for the sources of heat. And if you know for a fact you've made a change and there's a module that's sitting you know, 10 code steps away, and eh, chances are that's not something you're going to have to be too terribly concerned about. But if you notice that there's a library that links up with that library 10 steps away, that's no longer 10 steps away. That's a next door neighbor. That's part of feeling your heat. So in conclusion, definitely identify area that are potential issues, be able to talk about them in a meaningful way with your development team. We want to look at our systems objective, objectively and figure out where we can test effectively. And if we can't, we wanna be able to talk to those areas as much as we possibly can. Testability is not an easy fix. I'll tell you that right now. It's an ongoing process. You're never going to get 100% handle on it. There's always gonna be something new. And especially if you add a new component or you need to take out something you were using for a long time and replace it with something new, you're gonna to have to go through the testability conversations all over again. It requires focus. It requires consistent communication. You gots to roll your sleeves up and you gots to dig in. And you have to keep asking, is this testable? And so the fact is, it may not be. Some pieces may not be. You might not be able to work with it this, exactly the way you want to. But over time, you will make it more testable. And I'll tell you again, Testability is a part of usability. If you make a product more testable, you are effectively making a product more usable. And honestly, I think that's an outcome where it's a win for everybody. And here's my references for this talk. So I'm gonna encourage everybody to take a look at it. I'll leave it up here and uh, Q and A, it's open. And also uh, I'll say if anybody on the live, if you're still here, <laughs> uh, if you want to ask questions at this point, I am now able to do so. And uh, also we'll, 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 so over to you, Phil, or anybody who wants to throw out, throw out a question if you got one. Does anybody have any questions? I have a question that's a little bit uh, uh, windy or complicated. In the beginning, you talked about the scientific method yeah. And observing something and then thinking about why this happened and asking a question. And I'm interested a lot in nutrition. And, you know, one of the things they say, oh, you know, if you eat eggs, it has a lot of cholesterol and it's bad for your cholesterol. If you, you eat a lot of salty food, it's bad for your, high, your blood pressure. But 
those questions that they asked were rather very biased when they started doing these experiments. And later they found out that, well, you know, eating a lot of salt really doesn't raise your blood pressure that much. And eating a lot of eggs really doesn't have anything to do with your cholesterol. So I'm just wondering from a testability point of view, you know, what guidance can you give us for asking the right questions? Because asking the right questions is really important. Well, you already hit upon a very key thing in that respect, and that is understanding bias. Now, why was it? If you, if you think back now, I'm also into nutrition and exercise and stuff like that. So I remember the, these exact things happening. And I'm also old enough to remember when this happened. You know where a lot of those studies came from, especially when it came to eggs? Companies like Kellogg's, Post, and General Foods were the ones leading those studies. What do those companies have in common? Well, they don't sell eggs. What do they sell? <laughs> Stuff that people, they want you to eat besides eggs. Let me give you a key indicator. They sell <laughs> breakfast cereals. Okay. okay. Breakfast cereals were not a real common thing to be eating prior to like the 1970s. And part of it was, that's when these studies about, oh, too many eggs and bacon are bad for your health because it can boost your cholesterol and high blood pressure and all this other stuff. Now, it certainly can if you eat in radically copious amounts. And that was the part that they didn't really share was when you see a study, for example, it's important to be critical about what that study is saying. Is that study something that you can look at at face value and say, okay, the medical examiners for this guaranteed that uh, by eating eggs, my cholesterol level rose up. Okay, who's eating the eggs? How many eggs are they eating? What is their you know, body fat percentage or what is their lipid profile before eating eggs? How many people were part of this study? How many... Um, you know, people were part of the control group. How did they determine who was part of the control? You see, these are questions. These are questions you can ask of about course. this. And of it's course. and, and, yes, and that, so the key to this. And, and again, I'm, I'm I'm not trying to take this upside, but I'm giving that you need to do the same thing when you are talking about what it is that you're testing in an IT space. You still have biases. Here's a perfect example of that. When I talk about accessibility, one of the key reasons I bring up accessibility and the fact that I use the WCAG uh, option for that is it's easy to, when I say easy, I mean, there's something I can point to, right? Here is a area of concern. Here is a level of compliance. Here is something that we wanna do. Remember my example before, um, we don't want colors that don't have a significant enough contrast. Well, who decides that? See, if I had been the one doing that color contrast test 15 years ago, before my current age right now, I would have said, oh yeah, no, these look great. There's plenty of contrast here. I can tell those apart just fine. Or yeah, this color example works really well. Well, I don't have color blindness, but I do have uh, you know, those hardening corneas that everybody over 45 gets to where you need to wear reading glasses. And at a certain point, if I take my reading glasses off and I look at the screen, mm, you know, now even the colors and the contrast that I thought, oh yeah, that's fine. Now, if I look at it, I, I struggle and I can't exactly say, oh, is that enough contrast? It looked like it through my glasses, but now, oh, I cannot tell what's, what's A or what's B. And that's not including people who are colorblind. So if you have a certain type of colorblind, a red color blindness or a blue color blindness, and a red and a blue are right next to each other, if you have normal vision, those colors are going to look fine. There's not going to be any problem in differentiating them. But if you're colorblind, they might blend together, or you might not be able to tell the difference between one or the other. And that's, some, that's a bias. And that's a bias that has to be overcome. So you want to be able to step back and say, Am, do I have the full indication here? And if I run this experiment, is this experiment going to give me a value that will hold up under scrutiny? It's going to give me a value that I can talk about in a meaningful way. 
Now, again, if I'm using subjective criteria, maybe it won't. But if I'm using criteria that's objective, like a numeric value, hey, WCAG says you need to have a contrast ratio of 4.5 to 1 or better, and we don't have it. That's an easy thing to communicate. Um, same deal, like when you're talking about the, uh, the, the, the cholesterol example from, from, the, from the nutrition study. Who asked the question, how are we determining this? How do we know this? Are we comparing apples to apples? Do we have a bunch of fit people that we're testing against who already have a really base level LDL that's super low to begin with, so anything that we give them is gonna jump it up? Or are we dealing with people with a more normal and sedentary lifestyle who already have maybe a reasonable baseline or that if we give them the same amount of food, it's not going to, it's not going to bump it up? What are we doing to influence yeah. the test? That's as important as what the test is. Right. I see Angelo oh, left already. He went to bed. But, uh, oh, no. <laughs> does anybody else have any questions? Michael, I, I had a question. Um, <clears throat> you kind of talked about this a little bit with the, the pairing uh, with the tester, with the developer. But what if um, neither the developer nor, nor the tester know anything about the domain knowledge that they should know. For oh, example, yes. you just get up there and how do you know that uh, there is a thing called color contrast ratio or, or something like that? How does the tester work with that? That's a very good point. Um, so I used, like I said, I, I used accessibility as an example, primarily because that's in my wheelhouse. So who would call me in for uh, for a test pairing in that regard. Well, somebody who's working on accessibility and wants to be able to have somebody who's got some experience with it. I Even today, uh, with my old product, every once in a while, somebody will contact me and say, hey, Michael, do you have a few minutes where we can talk about this? Because I've got an accessibility question. Oh, yeah, sure. Glad to. No problem. Hey, I'm hoping to get on a, you know, I'm hoping to get on a pairing session. Would you be willing to be a third wheel? So, oh yeah, backseat driver, gladly, <laughs> no problem. That's what, and that's sometimes what I refer to myself when I jump into those sessions. I'm a subject matter expert, quote unquote, in accessibility and inclusive design. So if they're having conversations about that, they know that they're welcome to call me to their uh, pilot navigator pair and I'll be a backseat driver if they want me to be. Uh, sometimes it could be something where I'm saying, hey, here's what you wanna do, or this is relatively simple, you want to look for this, here's the WCAG example, or you can load up uh, Axe development tools. And once you load up Axe development tools, you can just scan it regularly and see if you're in the ballpark or if you're not hitting it, or you can look for your color contrast and it will tell you what the separation is. There, that might be all that they need. Now, if they need something deeper, it's like, well, can you help us with, how would you interpret the usability of this? That's a bigger question. And that might be where I would be more involved. Not so much. I mean, seriously, I could say, hey, go to deck, upload the axe uh, accessibility toolbar, and uh, you're off to the races. That's fine. Um, or if they want to say, hey, how do I automate this? Oh, okay, here's the library you want to use. Here's how you load it. Um, here's the commands that you might want to run. Here's the API specification. Now you've got that, you'll need to do a little bit of study with that, because I can't really handhold that for you. But Take a look at that, and that's probably enough for what you need to do. And then I might take the tester aside and say, hey, while they're doing this part and they're developing these things, here's some things you might want to look at just from an eyeball perspective or while talking to them so you know what they're doing and whether it makes sense. Like if you can just, like I've already said, if you're looking at uh, a, uh, two, if you're looking at a, um, a single A compliance, a double A compliance, or a triple A compliance, those are three different criteria. And if you want to meet all of them, you can either set it so that you go for the maximum, which may or may not be beneficial or kind of tricky to deal with, or you may have it stepped to where you can choose to do it. I oftentimes tell people, you know, if you want to master the, like, if you want to make sure that you have screen depth recognition and you want to be able to have the type be something that's workable for accessibility, you can do it one of multiple ways. You can either make it large enough and give the color con contrast that you want to use, or you can put a slider up at the top that lets you expand the font in a scalable way. The beauty about that is that's compliant because you're giving the user a simple way to change what they need to for 
you know, for, for visual impaired or for hearing impaired, et cetera, so that you can call it in at a, at a given level. And that way you can accomplish all three possibilities, or you can even have a contrast value where you go low, you know, normal contrast, high contrast, super high contrast. And by doing so, you give them the opportunity and you can say, hey, we want to be able to match for everything. Most companies are only going to really require a, a 2A level requirement for, for WCAG. So you don't have to go 100% on everything. And you can do a little bit at a time. Again, that's using accessibility as my personal wheelhouse and how I might be of a benefit to that. But yeah, what I would add is if you have two people that don't have any expertise in a given area, seek out a subject matter expert for one of those sessions, pair with them or do a Zoom call with them and get to know a little bit about what they can offer or even just say, hey, would you be available for X amount of time just to do a quick run through? Like say, could we borrow you for half an hour? Just to be able to look at something here and eyeball it and tell us, yeah, we're on the right track or no, you got some more to work with. And that also works. And that's one of the things I'm used to doing. So I hope that answered the question. <laughs> Jeez. Okay, yes. Michael. Well, yep. thanks very much. Um, thanks very much for sharing your expertise and experience in uh, quite a wide variety of topics, not just testability. I, I really learned a lot. It was, it was fantastic. Um, Lastly, you know, if, if anyone here wants to register, there's the, uh, thanks for putting this up there, Michael. There's the registration code PNSQC bookworm and you get 10% off plus uh, 80 bucks worth of some great books by Eric Benendahl, our keynote speaker on uh, Monday the 11th. So look forward to seeing you at the conference uh, on October 11th. And thanks very much, everyone, for attending. And th especially thanks for Michael for sharing his knowledge. Well, thanks, thanks for having me, everybody. OK. Have a great night. All right. Thank you all. Thank you.